for the Lord's glory. Hope that you have been blessed so far this Sabbath morning. Uh, this is nowhere near the beginning of our activities on Sabbath morning. We started at 9 o'clock uh, this morning in the Fellowship Hall with the Spanish service. Uh, got to see some of our Spanish brothers and sisters enjoying Sabbath school over there. And then at 9.20 we went to the youth room in which we had a nice song service for the kids before they went to their various classrooms. And 9.45. Thanks to everybody who participates in helping our first part of our Sabbath morning be a big blessing. And now as we transition to church time, we're so happy to see folks uh, coming into the sanctuary, even as I speak. We've got our schedule here on the front of the bulletin. We hope that you'll consider participating in some of the afternoon activities. Uh, for example, immediately after church service, we've got a prayer group here. If you've got a burden on your heart or something that you want to pray for, or just have some extended time with Christian brothers and sisters, we circle up the chairs. We have a lovely, unhurried prayer time. It's a beautiful thing to participate in. We also want to, participate, to uh, greet those who are participating online, whether over Zoom, here live. Greetings to those, and thank you to the Lightfords for facilitating that, and also to anybody watching on YouTube after the fact. Always a day or two after our church service, we post the service on YouTube, so if you ever miss out, you can catch up uh, on a future Sabbath or any day during the week. If you're ever traveling or ever sick or out of town, uh, you can use either of those options to keep up with what's going on here in the church. We want to thank everybody for their faithfulness and their giving. As you can see, last week we superseded our weekly need. Does that mean that we sit back and relax now? We don't need to give anymore? We have had far more weeks with red ink than green ink there. So while we are so thankful for the faithfulness of all the church members, we do ask continued uh, faithfulness responsibility as we reflect God's goodness toward us in our giving plans. Um, we are planning on next month having a business meeting after potluck in which all the details of the church finances will be discussed in like a PowerPoint uh, format. We don't want things to be mysterious, but we want to let you know the reality of all the th different things that your offerings and tithes go to. This afternoon, the Kids Clubs and Pathfinders and Adventurers will be starting at 3 o'clock out in front of the Fellowship Hall. Big thanks to Brother Margarito and Sister Alicia Cruz for uh, leading our Kids Clubs as they learn about Jesus and have fun activities in the meantime. And then at 4.30 this afternoon, we have a hike. Our outdoor hiking club is going to Foothill Ranch to hike the Borrego Canyon Trail to Red Rock Canyon. And the pictures that I've seen of that place are beautiful. You can Google them right now if you want to see what they look like. But we're going to meet at 4.30 in the Ralph's parking lot there in Foothill Ranch. I tried it on my phone a day or two ago. Take me to Ralph's in Foothill Ranch and it takes you right there. It's going to be a couple hour hike with a four mile uh, round trip. Generally easy, but the day is supposed to be warm. So bring a hat, bring sunscreen, bring extra water, bring comfortable shoes, perhaps a walking stick, and uh, come out to have a good time. Um, that should be after the heat of the day, so hopefully we'll be a little cooler by the day. You may remember that our church is also active during the week. We have several activities that go on. Four days a week we collect food from the food bank. And so if ever on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Friday or a Sabbath you want to help us accommodate and get stuff in freezers so that it can stay good until our distribution day on Wednesday, we would love to have you participating with us. Distribution is every Wednesday at 5 p.m. And it's no questions asked. Come and receive a heaping box of food. We're still doing drive-through service primarily, although some people walk up or bring a bike, but you just need to be able to carry the box of food off of the campus if you do that. But it's a lovely time. It's a little slice of heaven serving with the fellow food bank volunteers. We really appreciate it to everybody who participates. Also, every Wednesday, there's a midweek email that comes out with a devotional thought and the church prayer list and announcements for the church for the weekend coming up. So if you want to be plugged in with what's going on, uh, you know, upcoming in church, make sure you're on that email list. If you are not, as of now, feel free to text me or email me. My information is there on the bottom of the back side of the bulletin. Or you can even tear off a corner of the bulletin and hand it to me with your email address. We'll be sure to get you in on those weekly emails. We've also got our midweek prayer and book discussion group. We spend uh, an unhurried time in prayer together. Such a blessing to have a midweek check-in. And then we discuss a chapter of the book. We're currently in Patriarchs and Prophets. This week we'll be discussing Chapter 5 about Cain and Abel being tested. We've also got board meeting on Tuesday at 7. So board members, please make a note of that. Please make it a priority to attend and get any agenda items into the office ASAP. And all members, please pray for our leaders as we discern and decide and implement uh, God's plans for our church going forward. Of course, one of our big activities late next month, we're going to be having Vacation Bible School last the week of June. I believe that both Griselda and Jenny have actively been recruiting volunteers. We've got the well there in the foyer. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. Please be inviting already friends and neighbors. We're also looking forward 
forward to a church blood drive on June 25th. Uh, you can go to redcross.org to sign up to donate. Uh, that will be uh, on a Sabbath morning here in our fellowship hall. We are continuing to hold church potlucks every fourth Sabbath of the month, so that'll be two weeks from today. We'll have a church-wide potluck where everybody brings a vegetarian dish to share and some wonderful fellowship. My heart was filled a couple weeks ago when we did our first one back after the pandemic. Got some birthdays to celebrate this week. We are rejoicing with the Ibarrio, Ibarra family for Braulio's birthday coming up. Also, two birthdays in the Wozencraft family. And last week, you guys had two birthdays. I hadn't realized that the Wozencrafts all had their birthdays so close together. Happy birthday to your family. Pass on happy birthday to Julie and you on Friday, looks like, right? All right, another year younger. Huh? Very good. Praise the Lord. We want this place to be filled with all the sincere believers, but more importantly, with the presence of God. Amen? Let's invite God into our hearts and into this place as we stand to give the invocation and the invitation to worship. Come on up, Brother Craig. Thank you.
Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the precious truth that we are redeemed. No matter what type of week we have had, perhaps a discouraging week, perhaps an exhausting week, we know that our account with you is pure in heaven. And so, dear Lord Jesus, we ask you to encompass this place. We ask you to come into every heart, and we ask you to remove any hindrances that we have in our hearts, dear Heavenly Father, that may block your Holy Spirit's glowing, refreshing power in our hearts. As uh, some folks may still be on their way, Lord, we ask that they will get here safe and sound so that we may rejoice and worship with them. And please, Lord, bless anybody who is watching this after the fact online. Please fill each home with your harmony, your glory, your purpose in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we mentioned during announcement time, every morning at 9.20, we have an all-ages Sabbath school in the youth room, and we have such a fun time then, but that's not the only time we give our boys and girls, is it? By no means. We give them a special time right in the heart of our church service. We are so blessed to have precious boys and girls, many members of the kingdom of God in our very midst. We're going to ask the boys and girls to come and sit on the steps, and we're going to start with a couple special piano pieces by one of our fellow kids, before Sister Claudia gives us her story. Do you guys have green? Is that a platypus? Yes. 
Yes? Well, this is a wonderful animal, boys and girls. I love this animal. Can some of you tell me what are some of the special things about this animal? Yes? Um, it can swim. Okay, it can swim. Is that they live only on water? This is a question. No. 
they just go get food from the water, right? But they actually have to come to land, right? So according to its time, so God said that it was really good. Okay. Now, why do you think that God made the platypus just the way he made the platypus? Do you think that it's God got all their animals and put it together uh, in a platypus and then he made a platypus? Well, God made it for a purpose. What do you think? He made it for a purpose? That's right. He made it for a specific purpose. The platypus was made to do what it does, right? It's made to go underwater and to um, look for their food. And it, made, it needed that type of, of tail, right, and bill to go under the water. God made it just the way he wanted him to make it, to do the things that he wanted him to do. Now, that makes me remember and helps me remember that God created everything with a purpose. Next slide. The Bible says, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. Meaning, everything has a meaning and why you were created. Now, do you think you have a purpose? God created for you for a purpose? Yes. Or just to be in your family and that's it? Or God has plans for you. What do you think? He did it for a purpose? Yes. God has a plan for your life. Just like He created the platypus, He created you in a special way. And all of you have different things that you made this world a better place. You all contribute. God made you special, made you for a purpose. And He has a plan for you. And God will, little by little, tell you what the plan for your life is. And I want you to remember, every time you see a long giraffe with a long neck, it looks kind of strange, but a plan because you remember that God made it for a purpose. To do what they do. And he made you also for a purpose. And God has a plan for you. A special plan for you. Okay? So follow Jesus. Because he has a wonderful plan for your life. You can go back to your desk. Mm -hmm.
We come to you in the merits of the precious blood of Christ who shed his precious blood for our sins. And thank you, Father. And Father, I want to thank you, Father, for you are so gracious. I want to thank you for bringing us together here again once more on this Sabbath day. This beautiful Sabbath day. The miracles you have made on our behalf. For us to gather here as a family, yes, we are diverse, but we have a magnificent, great thing in common. And that's that we love you, Father, and that we seek you continually. Thank you, Father. And Father, as I am here today, I think of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Sermon of Mount, where he said, Pray not as a heathen. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not like unto them, for your Father knows what you need of before you ask Him. So, Father, I pray for every single person here and for us as a church family that you give us this day those things that we're in need of today, tomorrow, and for the week to come. Thank you, Father. Be with our pastor who has prepared a message for us this day. We pray and ask all this in the name of our Lord of glory, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much, Devin, for facilitating that moment of reflection with your beautiful music. Thanks to all the participants today of the different types. Thank you, uh, Craig and Eliana, for your readings. Thank you, Brother Jonathan, for bringing us before us to in prayer. And thank you, Sister Claudia, who in double duty, both children's story and translating uh, for the headphones today. Thank so appreciate it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart to all of these participants. No more hindrances. What is a hindrance? We all have hindrances in our lives. What would the general definition of a hindrance be? Something that blocks you? Something that gets in your way? Something that inconveniences you? Or something that shuts you down completely? Wipes out your plans all together? We experience it, don't we? Probably the quite literal way, traffic on the freeways is a common hindrance to us, so frustrating. How about that coworker who blocks all of our good ideas in the group project? Or maybe gets the promotion ahead of us? They can be a hindrance as well. We all got a big hindrance a couple of years back with the COVID pandemic, didn't we? We're still suffering its effects. The economy is still rippling. And of course, we are still seeing the results in educational statistics. We are getting back to normal, but we still feel the difference socially Perhaps spiritually we are affected and hindered by it. So with a sermon entitled, No More Hindrances, are we talking about no more external interference, injuries, health concerns, job cuts, etc.? Unfortunately, no. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. It's not a maybe, it's not a possibility, it's not a... This will be totally avoided if the Lord is on your side. By the way, the Lord was entirely on Jesus' side. Did he have his difficulties in life? To the max, yes? Jesus said, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart. Even in the midst of that apparently bad news that God will not simply take away the external difficulties, take heart is Jesus' counsel. Why? Because I have overcome the world. The world will give you trouble. But take heart, the world does not have the last say. Amen? Jesus, and only Jesus, has the last say. Yes? We can at least say amen to that, which is nothing else. But, there is more good news, dear friends, in our sermon today. Here is a verse that I just as easily could have made the scripture verse today. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews is down toward the end of the epistles. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Hebrews chapter 12. Some pastors put the verses on the screen. I don't put the verses on the screens intentionally because I want us opening our Bibles. Yes, and it's of course fine if you use a, a tablet or a phone, what have you. But get to Hebrews chapter 12. We want to be familiar. We want to be getting into it. Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Say amen if you're there. Amen. And it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and that's referring back to chapter 11, in which it enumerated many, many of the biggest biblical heroes of the Old Testament, in light of these, in light of their testimony, in light of their example, what should we do? Paul's advice, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Paul uses this illustration of faith life as running a race three or four times in different epistles of his, but this is the only place that he gives this specific advice. Let us throw off everything that hinders. That's a hindrance, yes? Get rid of it! Paul's advice and run that race. Could you imagine trying to run a race with a 30 pound suitcase? Sometimes we go to the, to the airport, what's the limit there? 50 pounds? Imagine having a 30 or 40 or 50 pound suitcase and you're trying to run a marathon with it. How successful will you be in your marathon? I've been to, I've done a half marathon and I have seen, long time ago, and I've seen people running marathons. Do any of them carry big heavy suitcases with them? Why would they? It is a deterrent, a detriment to the race, yes? And what might we be carrying along with ourselves that spiritually could be the equivalent of a 30 
your 40 or 50 pound suitcase. Let that go. Whatever holds you back, whatever hinders you, let it go. That's not his only advice. Also, let go of the sin that so easily entangles us. Alright, we're using the illustration of running a marathon now. What if you had a jump rope tied around your ankles and you were running the marathon? How would that be? What if you had a 30 or 40 or 50 pound suitcase and the jump rope around your legs? How successful are your chances of running that marathon? Get rid of that unnecessary, that burdensome, that entangling stuff, Paul says. Let there be no hindrances in your faith life. So I ask you, what are your hindrances and what are your entanglements today? We probably, and I'm going out on a limb here, we probably do not take this advice perfectly in our life. We might be even having something small. We might be trying to run the marathon with a fanny pack or with a, um, a cat's cradle string around our feet. But even that is a hindrance and Paul's advice, why would you compromise? Your completion. Why would you compromise your best time in this marathon illustration? The walk of faith is one that is to be walked freely. Amen? And to borrow from the Apostle John, we walk in this group, in the light, in Christ's light, and we have fellowship with one another. Why would we bring along our hindrances? Well, the truth is, we bring our hindrances because on some level we lack like them. We like having whatever it is with us that bogs us down. And we want to do both. We want to run the race, but we also want to bring a whole trunk full of our stuff. And there comes a, a time in life, friends, when we have to choose one or the other. Are we going to continue racing, or are we going to cling to the stuff? You know, I remember Jesus had an interaction with a young person who decided to cling to his stuff. Do you remember that? The rich young ruler, he had a divided heart, didn't he? He wanted to follow Jesus. He said, what must I do to keep eternal life? He talked, Jesus talks to him about keeping the commandments. Yes, I've done so since my childhood. One thing you lack. All the stuff that you have is holding you back. Sell it, give it to the poor, follow me, live a free and new life. And that rich young ruler, don't know if it took him five seconds or thirty seconds or five minutes, but he made the choice to hold on to his stuff. And he walked away from Jesus sad. He was sad because of what he was wanting to cling to. It would have been a sacrifice for him to give up that stuff, but how many happy days would he have had following Jesus and seeing his ministry play out? Are we clinging to stuff that hinders us in running the race? Uh, Paul uses that phrase, the sin that so easily entangles. And isn't that true? It is so sticky. It is offered to us as a delight and as a treat that's just going to be for a moment. And then you can put it down and you can keep running your race. But it sticks to us, right? It's like trying to get gum off of your shoe. It's trying to get cobwebs off. Have you ever, like, gotten a cobweb into your hands and without a seat to wash it off? I mean, you're really stuck there. That is what sin is like for us, friends. It tends to stick and it tends to glob onto us and it tends to hinder us more and more. Praise the Lord, we do have a solution for the stickiness of sin. Amen? Anytime we humble ourselves in sincere prayer before the God of the universe, confess our sin, admit that we were in the wrong, and say, Dear Jesus, as we said in the prayer today, thank you, Jonathan, cleanse us by your perfect blood shed on our behalf. Praise the Lord, the sin slides away. Amen? Amen. But we are tempted, we are tempted to go back to the reservoir of sin, right? And for some it might be in the refrigerator, for some it might be on the Roku remote, the streaming remote, yes. These vices, these sins that we habitually return to, they can be like prisons. And I've talked to people in my office who have vices that they got during their teenage years. And here they are, gray-headed in my office, weighing down and burdened because of these vices that they haven't been able to let go. Well, friends, I've got good news, too, about sin and resisting its temptation. Next Bible verse here is going to be 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. First Corinthians 10.13, I love hearing those pages rustling. 
I'm an old school person. I like an open book in front of me, but as, as always, it's fine if you're in a device or something like that. Say amen if you're in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Amen. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. You know what that means to me, friends? It means Satan doesn't have so many tools in his toolbox. He's only got a dozen or so that he throws at everybody. And these sins are harmful and these sins are shameful, but don't ever give in to the idea, friends, that your sin is so unique and your sin is so horrible that it's something that God has never seen before or that humanity hasn't seen frequently. Yes? No sin has overcome you. No sin has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. Satan is very limited in his tools. I like any verse that minimizes Satan and his power, yes? And as we continue, he uh, and God is faithful. Praise the Lord for that, amen? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That means every temptation that comes to you. That means every situation that it seems that a sinful path is the best path to take or the only path to take. It is not so. You cannot be tempted. And my study Bible here says that uh, that word in Greek can also mean tested beyond what you can bear. God in His faithfulness will not permit it. It's like He's got a leash on Satan. Satan can only go so far. Do you remember that conversation at the beginning of the book of Job? Say, uh, Satan is accusing Job of only worshiping God because he's blessed, and he's accusing God of not having true servants. And God's like, okay, but you can only go this far. And when Satan comes back a second time, okay, but you can only go this far. And Job was sorely and severely tested, was he not? But was it beyond what he could bear? Seemingly, externally, but did Joseph bear, did Job bear it and come out victorious in the end? He got a big affirmation from God in the end, did he not? Now I will admit, I'm not as righteous as Job, and I've not been tested as hard as Job. Many of you guys have been tested beyond what I have, but I trust this word to be faithful. Amen, dear friends? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond that which you can bear. And let's make a quick reminder here, a quick time out. Do we resist sin in our own strength? Remember when Jesus was tempted three times, yes? Did he answer in his own strength? I think Jesus could have. I think Jesus could have got a shockwave, a lightning bolt. Get out of here, Satan. You have no place here. Jesus quoted scripture every time he was tested. Did you notice that? Every time. It is written, Satan. God has an answer for that in his word. I've heard people say they're against proof texting at times. Looks like Jesus is proof texting why he shouldn't follow Satan. If it's good enough for Jesus' method, it's good enough for me. Amen? Learn that Bible. Store it in your memory that the Holy Spirit can bring it out at the opportune time. You can say, uh-uh-uh, Satan. The Bible clearly talks about that. So next time you are in seemingly an impossible situation, there's no way out except to sin. Uh-uh-uh. God's Word is faithful right here. Amen? God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are and it will surely come. And you are not to blame for how you are tempted, are you? Because it is Satan who does it to you. We have a Savior, says the book of Hebrews, who was tempted and tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. Is Jesus to blame for how he was tempted? By no means. Are you to blame for how you are tempted? Well, sometimes we put ourselves in temptation's way, don't we? Sometimes we go into environments that invite temptation. But let's never forget, Satan is the tempter, and never feel guilty for how you are tempted. It's just his desperation. He's desperate, he's full of wrath because he knows his time is short. He's on a kamikaze mission. He knows he's lost the great controversy. He just wants to take as many down with him as he can, including you, because he knows you are precious to God. He knows it will hurt God's heart if he ensnares you and takes you away from him. But say, not today, devil, because I have a God who is faithful, not letting me to be tempted, pressured, tested, oppressed beyond what is bearable, but is always faithful to provide a way out. So that when that sin, when that temptation comes, you can endure it. You can withstand it. You can stand up under it, says different translations. In a sense, this could be bad news. <laughs> it means there's no excuses on the Day of Judgment, right? It means we can't stand before God and say, there was no way out of that. I just had to. That was a There's no excuse for us, dear friends. But the good news, God does not abandon us in our temptation. 
confusion. Amen? First of all, strength to withstand. Second of all, an escape hatch that involves living purely in his path. Jesus got put in path, in traps, you know, in moral conundrums. Shall we or shall we not pay taxes to Caesar? And this person who had multiple spouses, how will they be married in heaven? You know, these seemingly impossible situations. But every single time Jesus was tempted and tested, he always had a response that, wow, made the people marvel who had accused him and he shut their mouths. Jesus also said to us, don't be concerned about what you will say when you're brought in front of important people, governors and kings and the like. The Holy Spirit will give you the words you need at the proper time to give an adequate response. Amen? Maybe even an impressive response. So friends, in the workplace, with our bosses, or in family situations, be in the Spirit, be in the Word, trust the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom in the time of need. And praise the Lord, James 1.5, we can always pray for wisdom in how to respond, how to act. Amen? Amen? We are flawed, we are weak, we are um, compromised, but God working through us can still do amazing, powerful, remarkable things. Amen? Through God, it is possible to put down the hindrances. Through God, it is possible to untangle the entanglements of sin. Praise the Lord who gives us victory. Amen? In the book of Revelation, seven times Jesus says, to him who overcomes, and we believe that includes ladies as well, of course, to he or she who overcomes, I will give, and he gives seven promises, the water of life, and the hidden manna, and a new and special and secret name, and the right to sit on God's throne alongside Jesus, as Jesus overcame and sat on the throne with the Father. Would Jesus have said it seven times to the one who overcomes, if overcoming were not possible? Every time I meet somebody named Victor, I smile. Because victor comes from victory. Amen? Praise to the Lord who gives us victory. And praise for parents who name their children to remind us that we can be victors in Christ. Amen? We need not be defined by our entanglements. We need not be defined by our temptations. We need not be defined by our earthly definitions of salary or education level or beauty level or, you know, years left on our on our mortgage or our 401k, we are defined as children of God. Amen, dear friends? Let nothing hinder you from that. Cast off every single hindrance. So in light of this, friends, why do people desire to hold on to their vices and sins even as they try running the race of faith? It is because inwardly they believe Satan's lie that he offers the abundant life rather than Jesus. If I tell you you've got to give up that streaming show that glorifies sex or violence and you think, no, I can be a Christian and still have this, you are thinking that purity does not offer you the most abundant life. I'm sorry to tell you. You are at least partially giving into the lie that Satan offers freedom and thrill and happiness rather than God truly offering freedom, and truth and happiness. Yes, friends? Jesus said it so plainly. John 10.10. 10. I love it because it's easy to remember, right? 10.10. 10. We got it before us with our fingers. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly to the fullest, to the max, says some translations. And of course, he said that with absolute purity in his own life. And of course, we know that we're called to emulate him, make him our example. 1 John 2.6 says, whoever claims to live a righteous life in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. And so if Jesus is talking about the abundant life and he's exampling and he's offering purity, it must be that the abundant life is fully compatible with walking on the straight and pure path of faith. Amen, friends? Amen. Not that we won't stumble, not that we won't trip, but that is entirely different than carrying burdens with you as you try to run the race. Amen? Put down they needlessly harm you. They needlessly hinder you. As foolish as it would be to see cyclists in the Tour de France with an extra 50 pounds strapped onto the back of their bicycles going up the mountains. That is how foolish we must look to angels as we try to strive toward God holding on to vices and sins. So I encourage you, friends, have a heart to heart with God about sins and vices. You continue to carry what you think they offer you. 
why you think they're worth bringing along on this race, this journey, this walk, this marathon of faith life. Maybe you can make a deal with God. God, if you could reveal to me something pure that provides this joy without the drawback of this thing I have been cherishing, I'll switch, you know? I think for those who go out drinking, perhaps joining a hobby club could be just as fulfilling, if not more, and it doesn't leave a hangover afterwards. I don't know what your particular issue may be, but I know that if you're not taking this advice to cast off hindrances and entanglements, you're not living the best life God wants for you. You're living a compromised life. And sometimes life on the fence looks pretty good. <laughs> if the fence is the 50-yard line in a football stadium, you're never going to get to the end zone by sitting on the 50-yard line, are you? I got the advantages of this side, and I got the advantages of this side. But the goal has to be at the utter extreme of the one, the pure one. Amen? God wants only your benefit, friends. God does not want to deprive you. He's not going to ask you to give up anything except things that are harmful to you in the long run. And I promise you, every form of sin is harmful in the long run. Amen? The enemy does not come, the thief does not come, except to kill and steal and destroy. And many things that seem innocent enough and fun enough and safe enough on the surface, they go down into rabbit holes and foxholes that lead to destruction and death and broken relationships. Everything God offers will be restorative, regenerative, beautiful, pure. There will be no reason not to live in the light of day. Amen? We will have no deeds that need to be hidden. We will have no lies that we have to remember that we've told people so that we don't get caught in them later on. God wants your benefit and He's not going to ask you to give up anything except that which is harmful to you. I believe that there is a statement from Ellen White to that end. I tried searching it this week. There aren't enough unique keywords for me to find it. But if you know where Ellen White said that, I'd like to know that specific place because it's such a helpful principle. God is only asking me to give up things that hurt me. We finish up with our scripture verse today from Isaiah chapter 40. This will be the last place I ask you to turn in your Bibles today. Please go to Isaiah chapter 40. Such a beautiful passage. One year at Mesa Grande Academy, when I was the senior sponsor, this was the verse that they chose to be their, their verse for the year, and they had it on the back of their senior sweaters. Such a beautiful passage in Isaiah 40. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Starts with verse 27. Why do you complain, O Jacob? <laughs> we complain sometimes in our faith life, yes? Why do you say, O Israel, my way is hidden from Yahweh, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. To paraphrase, it is all His, yes? He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. You know, the prospect of starting a marathon, oh, it's just daunting, right? And in faith life, oh, the pastor illustrated the faith life as a marathon. Take God's strength, amen? He gives strength. If you feel weak, you fulfill the condition of this earth for God to fill you with strength, yes, and with endurance, yes? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Verse 30, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in Yahweh will renew their strength. Yes? It's as if you could get a power post partway through that marathon. And I love this illustration here, last part of verse 31. They will soar on wings like eagles. I'm sure on a windy day you have seen birds soaring. Quite effortlessly, right? Maybe over the cliffs of Corona del Mar. Uh, my parents kind of live on a hilltop in Riverside. And just to see these birds, are they exhausting themselves as they soar, as they glide up and down, you know, hills and ravines and way over this way, way over that way? They're letting the wind carry them. Amen? Put your wings out and let God's strength carry you. Amen? A bird can fly with efficient its talents, but there has to be a way in which a bird cannot fly anymore. Let go of any weight that hinders you, that you may soar to the heights of God, that you may spiritually be among the clouds in your religious life. 
What hindrances do eagles have? Do rocks get in the way of their soaring? What about gullies and ditches? Is that any problem for an eagle soaring? What about briars and thickets? Ah, oh, they haven't built a bridge over this canyon. Is that a hindrance to a bird? Neither? What about headwinds? Birds experience headwinds, yes? If wind is blowing hard from the west, does that mean that the bird is the only option to go east that day? Stay where it is or go east? No! It uses its wings and tilts them up to go high. And then it dives down westward against the wind. You can even face headwinds. Kind of like a sailboat can sail upwind. It's a lot more work than sailing downwind. But you can persevere despite the headwinds. Birds use microscopic corrections in their wings to do this. And maybe sometimes our faith just needs microscopic corrections that we may continue upwind, yet not get exhausted. Praise the Lord for birds going wherever they want, no matter which way the wind is blowing. And praise the Lord for Christians standing firm and going toward the goal of God, no matter which way the winds of society are blowing. Now, I'll tell you, I've seen the winds change a few times in my lifetime. We are not to be followers of the winds of philosophy or political debate or what have you, we are to stand firm and have our eyes on the prize. Amen, dear brothers and sisters? I pray that despite life's difficulties, despite its exterior disappointments, even its seeming devastations, and they are without question there, I pray that we can rise above it like birds soaring over mountain ranges. Yes, dear friends? This passage also uses the illustration of running and not tiring. Walking and not growing faint. Like our young years, right? When I was young, I could run a good distance before getting tired, and it felt like I could walk forever. Now, a few mile walk, I'm feeling it. But it reminds me of one of my favorite verses from one of my university professors, Dr. Charles Teal. Some of you guys may remember him. Uh, his, probably like his motto verse for life The path of the just is as the shining light that shines evermore unto the perfect day. Amen? The path of the just. And I know in and of ourselves we are not just, but with God holding our hand, with us exchanging our filthiness for His purity, we can be rightly declared just. Amen? The path of the just is as the shining, as the breaking dawn that bright, burns ever brighter unto the more perfect day. Proverbs 4.18. I pray that your life will resemble that, even as you navigate life's difficulties. Praise the Lord, we have community to navigate the difficulties together. We're going to be saying an anointing prayer among our post-church service prayer today because somebody is going through something so heavy and difficult in their life. But I'll tell you, it's been a joy getting to know them and this family better. And I am heartened to seeing their faith. We can be encouraged in each other's faith even as we see and even as we come beside people going through huge difficulties and problems. Do you want to be on that path of Jesus, dear friends? Do you want to lay aside every hindrance and see it just for what it is? It's a brick of coal. Why am I bringing this on my vacation? Why am I bringing this on my journey? Yes, I want to leave it behind and have absolutely no hindrances in my faith life. Amen? If that is your desire, would you stand with me for the closing hymn? We're going to sing Marching to Zion, and we're going to imagine doing it with no tangled up feet and no heavy burdens on our backs. Amen? Number 422, Marching to Zion.
Dear Lord, it is a beautiful vision that you have cast before us. Forgive us for when we bring our baggage, for when we bring our limitations, for when we bring our entanglements along this path. You long to free us, dear Heavenly Father. You would like us to be like an untiring bird soaring in the sky. And please, dear Lord, help us how to do it. We need the strengthening, dear Lord. We need the vision ever before us. Thank you that we always have your word that we can turn to, we can open it and find inspiration. Thank you for the community of faith, uh, a group of encouragement, and also accountability so that we can be on this walk together, not lonely, not discouraged, as you were very alone in your walk on this earth, dear Lord. Thank you for blessing us with Christian community. We pray a blessing on the remainder of the Sabbath day as brothers and sisters depart this place. We also pray for the afternoon activities. May your spirit be in all of them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Thank you so much for having come and worship with us today. If you are a visitor and you are looking for a spiritual home, we would love you to continue uh, at Anaheim SDA Church. I'm going to be on the courtyard for anybody who would like to have a conversation. We're going to circle the chairs here and have a prayer room. The deacons will be there for tithes and offerings to be given on the way out. And Pathfinders and Adventures at 3 o'clock. God bless you all. Oh, Brother Devin has a post before us. Please remain seated until he's finished. Thank you.